Welcome back to the Capato Architect Corner. Today we're going to talk about deployment pipelines from simple pipelines to intermediate up to complex pipelines. Welcome back to the Capato Architect Corner. In a past video, we talked about a Salesforce environment, how they can be simple and then they can grow in complexity based on different um, system landscapes with integrations, communities, and other system components. What we're gonna be talking about today is our pipelines that are involved in deployment. A pipeline is when you have your production environment where your end target for your Salesforce configuration, you don't wanna be doing your development there. So in let's call it basic Salesforce environments, you may have a Salesforce dev environment where you make your configurations and then you push to production. But that's not gonna give you a full software development lifecycle processes. So what I'm gonna be explaining is different levels of complexity of environments, dev, going to a UAT, going to a prod. And we're gonna talk about the intricacies and why, when and why you might need those types of pipelines. Let's start with this diagram, which I've shown in a previous video. This could be a simple sample, a sample system landscape that has some reasonable amount of complexity. We've got Salesforce in the middle. We have internal users, partner users, and customer users that each might be going to their respective digital experiences or uh, communities. We may have a couple of uh, ISVs. You may have DocGen and Signature, and you may have extra functionality, web to lead, email to case, web to case, and bi-directional integrations um, to different systems through a middleware. So as you work on this in a particular dev environment, your dev environments might be more simple. So I might have a dev environment that just has my Salesforce, no communities, and no integrations. I would need a dev environment where I was simulating some of my integrations. I would need a dev environment with my partner experiences. So I might have different dev environments that are focused on different functionality. So let's take a look at these dev environments and how the complexity of them on their movement to production. Here are two simple pipelines. At the top, we might have a dev environment, and this little open indicator is it's a, a, a developer environment. This one's halfway filled. That could be a partial environment, and then production. Um, I'm showing Capado in its own governance org, and I'm showing source-driven development with a Git repository. So here I would have my development, going to a non-prod QA, going to a production. Now, I have seen these at clients that are greenfield orgs where they're starting out simple and also where they might have a lot of configuration like a CPQ might be done in a CPQ dev, then going to CPQ QA, and then going to production. So these are two very simple, not so uh, enterprise grade level of complexity. Down below, we now have a single dev environment, maybe in a dev environment. Then we have a dev pro, and that's indicated, I don't have my legend showing, as a thicker line, a solid going for stage, for representing a full sandbox. So the full sandbox, this stage, would have the full data capabilities, license and data capabilities of production. And you have the ability, when you refresh um, from production, you can bring all of your uh, data over and that data can be brought from production using the stage refresh and brought into there. So these are two simple variants, dev to QA to prod and dev to QA to stage to prod. And as we talked about the previous slide with the environment, the system landscape, your dev environments might not have all of the complexity. Your dev environments may not have the doc gen, the digital signature. Your dev environments probably wouldn't have your um, uh, single sign-on, and, and you might choose in your dev environment probably would have the digital experiences. Now we're gonna move to a standard environment. This is a standard environment where I'm gonna issue my developers their own dev sandboxes, dev one, dev two, 
Dev 3, and I might have a specialization. I might, my Dev 1 might have my digital experiences. My Dev 2 might have the web to lead, web to case. Um, so, I, and maybe even Dev 3 might be where we're doing our integration development. So these devs each have their own place of working so they don't step on each other's toes, but they are working with a GET repository using source-driven development. They'd be using Capado for their deployment. And when you have multiple devs and ultimately they're gonna lead to a QA environment, you don't want the first place the work product of multiple developers meet to be in QA. Because that means when you do your QA deployment and you've got your QA testers ready, they are then finding surprises between developer one and developer two. So instead, you want to have a dev int, a developer integration environment where the work product of dev one, dev two, and dev three can meet, find your collisions, run your unit tests, and even some basic functional tests before you consider the push to QA. So multiple devs, should have a dev in controlled by the dev team, which they can have admin control and do debug any issues. And then you have your deployment to QA, most likely controlled by the release manager and the QA um, team lead. Once it passes QA, going to a full, a full sandbox in stage. And this is where you can perform your user acceptance testing, um, really validate the code, and then have the deploy to production and again, having Capado in a deployment in its own governance org and all of this done through source-driven development. Now we're gonna increase the complexity and have two different teams. One team could be working on a sales cloud functionality. One could be working on service cloud or custom dev. And so what we're having here is, and these two teams, team A and team B, might have a different cadence. One might be on, you know, starting, you know, at the beginning of this month with two week sprints with a go live six weeks later. Um, the other one might be halfway through their sprints and they're going live weeks or even a month earlier before the other team. So we have team A. And as I've shown you before, when you have team while well, team working together, they should they should have their own dev environments unless necess absolutely necessary. We could talk about that in a future video. They would have they would come together in a team A dev int where they're and they can have their that team, maybe the team lead has sysadmin access into the dev int. Then they may have their own QA team, which is doing QA, um, running through the test scripts, test scenarios, maybe even in the Capado robotic testing in this QA environment. Then they're gonna push to stage. Now here we're showing team A and team B having their own independent pipelines going into stage and they would need to schedule time and stage because if A is in stage and being signed off by your UAT users, you might not want B coming in at the same time. So this shows A coming into stage and B coming into stage. Now, one thing I would like to bring up when you have multiple dev A, T, dev one, dev two, dev three, you're gonna need to consider back deploys from the very beginning. So even back to here, if I have developer one, making changes, it gets into dev int, then I need to make, and I do any um, conflict resolution, find merge conflicts, I'm gonna wanna back deploy these merge conflicts back to two and back to three. So as I'm working in dev one, dev two, dev three, you need to be doing back deploys, back promotions backwards between them. So once they come together in dev int, then it's a forward progress only, pretty much forward progress only. But in the dev int, there should be multiple back deploys between the different dev teams to make sure that they're not that their code is compatible. Now, when we move to team A and team B, we also need to be considering back, the back deploys within the team and the cross team back deploys. We need to be considering how team A's work if they get to stage first, needs to be back deployed all the way through to team B so team A work product is being taken into account with team B and you don't get things like the same field, you know, opportunity close date and somebody else creates a field called date closed or close date. They both see business requirements, interpret them slightly different, create different fields, which really means the same thing. So we're gonna want these back promotions, back deploys. So A may go to B, B's work product, 
When it passes through the stage, it should go back to A. And so there's gonna be a continual potential back deployment between A and B on scheduled intervals and for code that has reached certain stages of approval. Now we're gonna to move to a complex environment. We can already see the complexities with A and B, with their back deploys in their teams, the back deploys between A and B, and they're reaching a UAT environment. This is a separate environment for user acceptance testing, separate from stage. Now, team C is now involved and they may have a completely different timeline. Maybe A and B are working on monthly releases, shorter agile sprints, and team C has a completely different cadence. So team C also may have secured their own UAT environment. Maybe they need a much more longer duration, stable environment during the UAT. And then they're gonna be able to push through their UAT. All of it will come together in a stage before it goes to prod. Again, with a Capato governance environment. Now we also, this environment pipeline might take into consideration hotfixes. Hotfixes to production, and they may have determined, this could be a, the lead architect's decision, that they want all hotfixes to go through stage before going to prod. So we're gonna have a hotfix dev, going to a hotfix QA, stage and prod. Now you need to be considering the moment a hotfix comes through into stage and then it reaches prod, it needs to be back deployed backwards to the C pipeline and to the A and B pipelines. So you need to be taken into consideration the back deployments to between the teams, but inside the teams, between the teams, and all the way down alternate branches of the pipeline. Now, there, I've even seen pipelines significantly more complex than this one, based on the number of teams, based on having digital experience baseline, CPQs, and even potentially multi-production orgs. But this gives you the example, as you see the progressive growth and complexity of a pipeline from your simple, intermediate, up to a more complex pipeline. So when I explain something, I like to start at the basic building block, something simple. What is the smallest that you would see? Then we can see, we can progressively add complexity, dev, QA, prod. Then we add a multi-team, dev, going to dev in, going to UAT, going to QA, UAT. And then we start to bring in two teams, three teams. And from there, we can go to significantly more teams and more complexity. So this way we can understand when you are a developer brought into a project and you see uh, multiple hops to production. I remember coming in on a team and I saw six or seven hops to production and I thought it was ridiculous until I saw the whole pipeline and understood the purpose for each of the steps. So this way, this is a baseline, understand when you start to see complex pipelines and what their purpose is. Hope this was helpful. Thank you for joining the Capato Architect Corner. May your deployments be swift and your bugs few. Subscribe to Capato and come back soon.